My name's Pikey Brown. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Pikey. I want to thank Roger for his build-up. I need him like I need a hangover right now, you know. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Thank you. Oh, I sure know who my enemies are in, in this part of the country. Uh, you know, uh, some of you people here know <clears throat> the one from Bullhead and some here from Laughlin. That Pikey is not my real name. Yeah. Pikey is a nickname that I acquired 74 years ago over in the Hawaiian Islands on the little island of Kauai, Kapaha, Kauai. My daddy was an engineer, and he and uh, his wife was my mother, and we all went to Hawaii, and that's where I got born, and that's where I stayed till I was nine years old, from 1930 to 1939. Then we moved from Kauai to Venice, California, and I stayed in that area up until about almost two years ago when I moved to Bullhead City. My real name, <clears throat> or my birth certificate, my first name is Elwood. Capital E-L-W-O-O-D. My middle name is Laverne. Capital L-A, capital V-E-R-N. Elwood Laverne. And that's the reason why I'm here today. <laughs> what are you laughing about? This is a serious program we got here. You know, I was sent to a... a uh, there's four or five of people in this room that I got... Uh, uh, Betty and I came in together years since 1966, and I, I got sober in September 1966 in uh, North Hollywood, California, which is in the San Fernando Valley, which is just about ten, about eight miles from the Valley Club. And I knew your sponsor, Captain Serenity. Boy, what a butt he was! I want to tell you, you know, Jesus Christ, but I loved him. I loved. Him. He died sober. He, he must have had her maybe about 25 years, maybe 28 years when he passed away. But I was sent to my first AA meeting when I was 29 years old, and that was in 1959. And back then, uh, I, I lived in San Fernando Valley. I bought a home. I, I left Venice. I went to Venice High School in Venice, California. I went to Santa Monica City College for a couple of years. Then I, then I moved to San Fernando Valley and bought a home out there. And uh, then in 1956, I was a butcher, a meat cutter by trade which I had been since I was 17 or 18 years old, and I became a, a real good meat cutter back in those years. I joined the, the union in Los Angeles, Local 421. I became a good union member, and I, I was working for different uh, meat markets. I worked for Safeway over in West Hollywood going back from 1950 to 53. Then I went to work for an independent grocery store in Westwood, California. Then when I was 26, I bought a meat market in Van Nuys, California, on Victory and Fulton. And I, uh, I was a worker. I was a drinker. I was smoking dope. But, you know, when you're younger years, you can maintain pretty well. And when I was 28, I bought another meat market in Glendale, California, which is about 12 miles from where I was. Then I had two meat markets going. Then when I was 29, I bought a grocery store in Panorama City, uh, I'm talking about 45, 50 years ago, and, and the San Fernando Valley was a beautiful community. Well, it's still beautiful, but no one speaks English there anymore, you know. It, it, it's a different locale from what it was 50 years ago. But anyway, I bought a grocery store in Panorama City. I stole my meat markets. And in that grocery store, I had a, I had a, a, a liquor license. Yeah, I had a had a beer license, had a wine license, and I had a whole grocery store full of wine and beer, and I didn't have any employers to tell me what to do and when to do it or how to do it, and I could do pretty much what I wanted as long as I paid the rent on my little building that I had my grocery store in. And my wife worked with me and had some hired help, and, and you know, as we know from this book, this disease, that this disease gets worse, never better. But when I was 59, before I bought the grocery, I just bought the grocery store in 1959. And the judge, 
in Van Nuys, he thought that I had a social drunk driving problem. <laughs> so he sent me to some of these A and A meetings, and I'm going back, you know, uh, Christ, uh, 40, 40 years ago. And there was even as big as L.A. was then, there wasn't a whole lot of meetings. And the first meeting I went to, I was 29, and and by then I had my grocery store. I was making quite a bit of money. I had a beautiful home about a block and a half from the grocery store. I had a big swimming pool in my backyard. I had a nice 19-foot inboard, outboard motor in my garage. I was totally solvent except for the mortgage on my home, and I had money in the bank. But I was a worker. You know, you hear about alcoholics or workers. Well, I, I worked. I, we were open from 8 in the morning till 9 at night, and I was working most of those hours for until, until I finally lost the market in 1965 when alcohol and drugs took over. But my first AA meeting was a little annex of a church in Van Nuys, right off of Victory and Van Nuys Boulevard. And I walked in that meeting, and there was about 15, it was a men's stag, I guess, about 15 men in there. They were all old. And I, was tw- I was a sweet, tender, you know, virginist type of 29-year-old, looking good, looking good. I walked in there uh, all dressed up like I am now to impress everybody. Yeah. I wanted to be all things to all people, you know. <laughs> I walked in there with a bunch of old men in there. They're all 50 and 60 and white-headed, and, and I sat down, and then uh, one guy was talking to their little table. They all, they all started talking, and, and as a matter of fact, when I was looking around the table, uh, three of those guys looked like that they died and no one notified them, you know. <laughs> Jesus. And then, and, and then one of them started talking to me because I was the only newcomer there. And I had court papers, so I was going, I was sent here by that messed up judge that I had to go to these A and A meetings. And, and uh, so he, he knew I was new. The guy did, the old man. He said, he looked at me. He says, <clears throat> he called me son. <clears throat> he says, son, if you want what I have, and he was 80 years old, you know. He says, son, if you want what I have, and if you're willing to go any lanes to get it, there's a few things you got to do. And I thought to myself, you know, that's one of the guys that looks dead here tonight, you know. And I saw he don't want what he's got. So I had my court paper signed, and I did my, I did around, they only gave you six meetings back in those years. I did my six meetings, and I kept on drinking from 1959 to 1966. And let me tell you, this disease is progressive. So if you're kind of new here tonight, and if you think you're kind of, kind of a young stud or a young fox, you know, alcohol doesn't know if you're young or old or a boy or a girl or a man or a degree or a pedigree. All alcohol knows is once it's got you. And most of you here know what I'm talking about. Once that alcohol got you, once you take that drink, that drink is going to take a drink. It's going to take people like you and me, like the book said. I wish we had that book here. It's going to take people like you and me into various states of being pitifully and incomprehensibly demoralizing to ourselves, and most certainly to our families and most certainly to many other people in our lives. And from that time frame, from 1959 to 1966, I was in, I was back in that Van Nuys jailhouse. I was in the West Valley jailhouse. I was in the, in the uh, Foothill jailhouse. We, uh, when I got sober, there was only one jailhouse in Van Nuys, and that was the one in Van Nuys. But the valley was growing. They started putting different police stations around the valley, and I hit them all. Trying to prove, like the book talks about. I was trying to prove that I could drink like other people. The great illusion, obsession of other of us alcoholics thinking that someday, some way, we're going to find a way to take a little drinky poo or two. Or a little pilly poo or two. <laughs> or a little liney poo or two. Or a little hitty poo or two off of a doobie doo like 80 do. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you, baby. It'll, it'll bury you. You know, you get that insane thinking, and baby, if you're a, like the book talks about, the real alcoholics. 
This is not Pussy Anonymous here. This is not where we come to get rid of the measles or the whooping cough. Or the flu, this is where we come to find God and find ourselves and get sober and get some sobriety and get our dignity and our self-respect, our self-esteem. You know, a nice-looking guy like me, as old as I am, you know, let me tell you. The last two weekends of August, 1960, he told me I was good-looking, so I got to say that, you know. The last two weekends of August 1966, when I came, we all know, what, most of us know what blackouts are. And by then I'd lost my wife. My wife divorced me when she was pregnant with my third, my fourth daughter because I tried killing myself on drugs. And But the last, I lost my home. I lost my the swimming pool, went with the house. It went to my wife. The, the judge gave me my boat. I sold my boat to buy my drugs and to buy my alcohol. From night when my wife divorced me in September 1965 from the San Fernando Valley Courthouse, and in that year, all the money I got from that from that sale of the business was gone. I paid it all to attorneys and doctors and women and going here and going going to Las Vegas, doing all those fun things, drinking and smoking dope and dying one day at a time. The last two weekends of August 1966, I pray I never forget this. When I came out of a blackout the third weekend of August 1966, I was stark naked. And a cop had a fire hose. And I was in the Van Nuys jailhouse shower, I was told. And I was naked. He was hosing doo-doo off of me because they caught me. You know where it is. Betty knows where it is. Walking up Van Nuys Boulevard towards Victory Boulevard with a couple of six-packs drinking that beer. And I was poo-pooing my pants in a blackout. How pitiful can you get? And Corky, was, I don't thank you for being here, Corky. Anyway. That's why I moved. Well, Corky brought me here in 1980 when he moved here. And I thought, well, if he can live there and stay sober, so can I, you know. <laughs> anyway, that was the third weekend of August. And they gave me some jail clothes, and I went out on the streets. And then when I came out of another blackout the next weekend later, so help me, I was in that same shower, this time sitting down in that jailhouse shower. Again, stark naked, had the same cop. With a fire hose, he was hosing me down again. In jail, they don't call you by your nickname anymore, you know. They call me, hey, Brown, how are you? You were here last weekend with me. Don't you remember? And I was sitting on the floor, and I was naked, and he was hosing doo-doo off of me again, you know. I wasn't raised to be that kind of a guy. But I want to tell you, if you're a real alcoholic, and if you pursue that delusion that maybe someday, some way, you're going to be like other people, you're going to go insane, and you're going to die. And you hang around here long enough. In the last 38 years, when I was a year and a half sober, my mother was an addict. She committed suicide on drugs. She wrote a suicide note. I took her to A with me a few times, but she didn't want what we had. Like many of us don't want what we have here. Apparently, we want what this program has. Then eight years, I had four daughters by then. Uh, so I'd taken my daughters to AA. <laughs> Excuse me. In 1970, Corky remembers this. Corky spent a lot of time with me back in those years. My daughter, number two, she was 19 years of age. I brought her to AA. I took her to con AA convention. She was a dope fiend since she was 13. When she was 19, a beautiful girl, five foot eight, and big blue eyes, long blonde hair. I got her a job. One of my customers, I got her a job modeling in a modeling place on Sunset Boulevard. She was a beautiful girl, and, and she was dating a rock musician from the, the L.A. area, and he, he rejected her, so she showed him. She went over to his recording studio. This is my daughter, my daughter number two. She took a bunch of drugs over there and wrote a suicide note, and she killed herself. She took those drugs and killed herself and wrote that suicide note. In the note, she didn't mention her mother or her father. She didn't mention, all she mentioned was her doggy Jubal, who was going to have puppies. And she says, make sure Jubal's puppies get a good home. And in that suicide note, she, she, she kept saying, I want to go home. I want to go home. Can you imagine that? A beautiful, intelligent, 19-year-old girl that has it all. And they drink and drug and write suicide notes and kill themselves. 
You talk about the insanity of this program. Like I said a moment ago, we don't come here to pussyfoot around. We don't come here to win friends and influence people. Think about that. Many of us in this room have been in jails. Many in prisons. Many of us have been divorced three times like me and five, to five times like, oh, oh, what's your name again? <laughs> so why do, why do you want to go to an A meeting and try to be all things to all people in that room? The book that I've had for 38 years now, it tells me in the book that we are the outcast of society. That's what the book calls us. That means that society doesn't want us. That book was written in 1939. If that book were written today, they wouldn't call us outcasts of society. They would call us wackos and wackoettes of society. So why do you want to come here to be all things to all people? In my book that I've been reading for half my life now, it tells me that we come here to be all things to God as we understand Him. And that's what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. Not coming here to win friends and influence people and to impress everybody in here and out there. I tried 35 years up and down Sunset Boulevard and Hollywood Boulevard when I had the money and the property picking up hookers trying to impress. And I was a happy married man back in those years, so to speak. Picking up those people, trying to be all things to all people. Uh, like you said, liar or cheat. And all. Yeah. And I was all of those in one way or another. And eventually, in, in life, out there, and, and most certainly in here, you're going to get what you give. If you give nothing, you're going to get nothing. But in here, we find that we have to, within time, we learn to give ourselves completely to the simple program. You know, most alcoholics are blessed with two lives. Think about this. The life that God eats in every one of us in this room. In most cases, it was pitiful and incomprehensible and demoralizing and lying and cheating and drinking and drug drugging. To all the things that people like us do. And we're so insane, we can find insane justification to justify our insane actions. This is the insanity. And then, that power we talk about. He reaches down and he touches us. And he says, I'm going to give you sobriety. And then we're given a second life, which we're all experiencing here today. But when he gave us the second life, he gave us the responsibility to take care of our new life. We have to change everything that we've done in the past and get new morals and values and get new people, places, and friends in our life. We stop playing the games out there in the bars and trying to be all those things to people that don't understand us. And many of us go insane and die. Yeah, when, when, when Penny died at, in 1973, I thought I was going to go crazy. I, and I was, I was eight years sober then. I, you, know, you know, you hang around here for 38 years. You have mothers. And then I had daughter number two's dead, daughter number one and daughter number three. Eight years ago, they went to prison for manufacturing crystal meth. And they all been to AA and NA with their daddy, but they don't want what we got, you know. And daughter number three was pregnant by some guy she wasn't married to. She had her baby in prison. So I've gone through all these things in 38 years, trying to maintain my sobriety and my dignity, and trying to let go and let God, let God run their lives. For you see, no human power could leave me or you over alcoholism. Only God could and would if he is sought. So if we're here looking to find God through money and profit and prestige and sex and women and careers, we're going to drink and we're going to die. Yeah. You know, we've got a lot of anonymous programs now. When I got sober 38 years ago, there weren't nearly as many as there are now. But of course, we've got Alcoholics Anonymous. They had just started Narcotics Anonymous back in those years. And OA, Overeaters Anonymous, started. So we got Overeaters Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, AA. We got Undereaters Anonymous. We even got Little Peters Anonymous now, you know. 
Oh, we got all oh, the all hang out here, baby. You know, yeah, this is this is where we come. You know, we don't we don't half measure nothing here. If you want to if you want to come and hang out here and be a little Peter, be a little Peter. You know, who cares? You know. But you can do it sober, and you can do it clean. You can do it with dignity and self-respect and self-esteem. Yeah. You know, I gave up a lot of things when I quit smoking. I was smoking dope on the Venice Beach when I was 15 years old under Venice Pier. Then I started drinking when I was 19. And so from 15 to 35, it was downhill all the way, except I was a worker, and I was a good meat cutter. I was a good grocery man, and I could figure percentages, and I made money doing that until the alcohol and drugs took over and damn near destroyed me. And then on September 3rd, 1966, when I got a kick out from the Van Nuys jailhouse, everything was gone. The wife, the four daughters, the home, the swimming pool, I sold the boat to buy my drugs, and I checked into the Vagabond Motel. You know where that is, and Betty knows where that is. Corky knows where that is. It's gone. it's gone now, but I checked in there September 3rd, 1966, just out of the, just out of, out of the jailhouse. And, and I bought a case of beer. I made, I made sure there was a liquor store right across the street. Yeah, I got to look ahead back in those days, baby, you know. <laughs> And I bought me a case of beer, and I had some reds. I love reds. Oh, yeah. Man, some of the best trips I was on, drop three reds and drink a couple of cold bottles of chilled ripple, red ripple. And, baby, you're there. You don't know where, but you're there, baby, you know. Yeah. yeah anywhere is better than here. Anywhere is better than here. That's why I drank and smoked dope to get away from me, not to get away from you. I thought I was drinking to get away from you, but I was drinking to get away from me. And I got, I was very successful with it until I checked in that motel. I checked in the 3rd of September, and this is a fact. They don't have too many, no, not too many computers going back 40 years ago, but it's on record. In that motel room, I was drinking my beer and dropping those reds, and I bought a lid. A lot of you older people know what a lid is. I bought a lid, and I was smoking my dope and dropping those reds and drinking that booze. And that was on the 3rd when I came to, so help me God, it was the 16th of September. Thirteen days I lost in a blackout in that motel room. I came to in the county hospital, literally strapped down. They give me alcohol in one arm, blood in the other arm to save my life. Unbeknown to me, when I was in the bathroom peeping, and I passed out. I fell through the bathroom shore, bathroom door. I cut the left side of my head open, almost lost my left eye. My left ear was almost cut off. I damn near bled to death before they found me. So you talk about out there pussyfooting around. I had the same opportunity when I got here and when I was 29. I had the money and the wife, the loving wife who was trying to love me the best she could, as sick as I was. I had the daughters, the home, the swimming. I had it all. But I, I was one of those ones that pursued that delusion that maybe someday, some way, I will be like other people if it kills me. And God damn it, damn near killed me. So I came to in that county hospital and they unstrapped me. And then I went back to court. I broke my probation for drinking. And the judge says, you know, we're going to get you off the streets. You're, 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 on the, you're, on, you're out in San Fernando Valley, poo-poo in your pants. You're going to mess up our, my city. You're going to go back to jail. You're going to spend six months in Chandler Lodge. And Corky knows who that is. The people from, from, F, from F, the San Fernando Valley know the Chandler Lodge. I, he says, you stay there for six months. If you leave for any reason, you're going to go back to jail for six months. So I stayed there for six months, and that's where it was given to me. That's where God gave me what I got today, sobriety. And in that six months, I had a lot of time to think, and I was writing stuff down, like my sponsor told me. He says, write all this stuff down, all these feelings you're having. So I started writing write these feelings down. I kept them all. And when I got out of the recovery home, I started reading these feelings, and I put these feelings together. One of them goes pretty much like this. For many years I wandered around with no place to go, like a king without a crown. 
and all my wandering, I was able to find a place or a home where I had peace of mind. But I continued to wander and I continued to roam, just looking for a place that I could call home. And all my wanderings, I was unable to find a place or a home where I had peace of mind. But I continued to wander and I continued to roam, just looking for a place that I could call home. And then that's when I found it. That's when I found that it's okay to be me. You know, sooner or later, every alcoholic will take their last drink. But we here in Alcoholics Anonymous, but for the grace of God, and only but for the grace of God, we live and learn to do what we're doing right this very moment, to share our experience, our strength, and our hope. And maybe a little more difficult for some of us so-called macho man in that recovery home 38 years ago. I was still living there 38 years ago from September to March 1997 I lived there. In that recovery home I found out that big boys do cry. I don't got to be a pillar of power in that recovery home with all those guys. It's okay to shed fears and tears. It's okay to be a human being. I don't got to walk in here or walk out there or walk up 95 or walk anywhere and try to be all things to all people anymore. I don't have to like everybody anymore either. I found I got to try to love them and accept them for who they are and what they are if they allow me to be myself. The people I don't particularly care for, my sponsor said, will pray for them. I said, well, I pray for him. I wish they dropped dead. Why do we pray for him? You know, <laughs> what a waste of my time. Anyway, he, he, he said, pray for him. So, so after 38 years now, every night when I get home, I pray for the people I don't like. I, so I get my list out. I got about six pages. <laughs> I half measure nothing, folks, you know. Pray the whole time. And I start praying for all these people by name. But I even went a little further than what my sponsor said. I even pray that each, when each one of these people, when they die, they go straight to heaven. Tonight. <laughs> yeah, you're out of here, sucker. Beam them up, Scotty, you know. Yeah, so I don't, I don't walk into the, the Lano Club. You know, I've been involved in the Lano Club for 43 years now. They're necessary. To me, there's sort of a, a necessary evil. Some of the people who who hang out at the Lano clubs, uh, when they share, it's amazing. When they, they're so spiritual, they just sort of levitate out of the chairs. And they float around the room. And then when they come across the river, they don't take the bridge. They sort of walk across, you know. And they're, and they're singing the battle hymn of the republic, you know. Or Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. Of course, my big book tells me so, you know. You know, you hang around here for 38 years, and you're, you're going you're to meet all kinds of people. You know, I got a good life now. You know, my first job, my, in that six months that I spent that recovery home, on one side of the street, it was industrial, and in the back of the recovery home, it was a, a little residential area. I saw, and I was too weak and too, I couldn't concentrate too well. And I, and I started mowing lawns in that little residential district and pulling weeds because I lived in a recovery home. I was paying $18 a week room and board back then, and I had to make enough money to pay my way. Anyway, my first room, when I got out six months later, the judge let me move out. I, I, I got my first job. One of the guys in the program, uh, I think maybe maybe uh, Betty would know, know him, Bob Crevier. Uh, he, he was managing the Volkswagen store on Reseda Boulevard in, in Reseda, California, which is all part of the San Fernando Valley. And I didn't have a car. My car was repossessed. I didn't have no money, no nothing. Anyway, he gave me a little Volkswagen to drive. And he sent me to Volkswagen school to find out that in Volkswagens back in the 60s, they were air-cooled and the engines are in the trunk opposed to the hood. Then I spent a week learning how to be a salesman. Then after I went to school for a week, uh, well, at the meeting one Saturday night, I said, okay, Pike, can you come to work Monday, put a shirt and tie on. Put a pair of pants on that that looks nice. You get a coat if you get one. And I walked in there to Snoochie Volkswagen. And that Monday morning, 
and I was working halfway decent. I was around seven months sober. And Bob says, okay, that, we had a little red Volkswagen right out in the middle of the floor. And this couple walked in about my age. I was 36 then. I got sober in September. I turned 36 in October the following month. But I walked out to the showroom floor. There was family about my age. I had a couple of little kids. And Bob said, now you walk out. He'd be confident. I was like, I'm scared. He said, stick your hand out and give him that AA smile and tell him, give him your name. So I left my office and I put my hand out. I walked out and I says, Hi, my name's Pikey. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and honestly, I had no idea what I said. Because I was in that recovery home for six months, orientated to say, Hi, I'm Pikey. I'm an alcoholic. I, I just came out. And, and, they, and that couple, that family left... left they couldn't get out of that building fast enough. Boy, they grabbed those kids, and man, they were like uh, Mach 1, you know. And I walked back to my office, and Bob says, Pikey, you did great. Except you don't tell them you're alcoholics. <laughs> and so I had to go through some training processes then. But I became a pretty good Volkswagen salesman. Well, my time's running out now, but, you know, this is a good way of life. If you don't want what you had out there and you want to retain your dignity and some serenity and some self-respect and sobriety and walk around, you know, we, we come here and every morning when I wake up and I have for half my life now, I ask my God to grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And Rob was talking about me not getting married. Very briefly, 21 years ago, well, Corky knows about this. Corky drove me to Las Vegas to marry this girl. I haven't forgiven him for that yet. I married this girl. I was 53. I was, you know, pretty much looking like I am now. I married her. So I was 53. She was 46. She was educated. Her only son was going to San Diego, San Diego State. I didn't have to support her or her kid. And I thought, well, and I loved her. And I married her. I came home work from sick one afternoon after five months. And I caught my new bride in bed with a woman. My bride in my in a bed with a woman. You know, that fucked up my whole day. You know. <laughs> I thought to myself, what an order. I can't go through with it, you know. But I tell you what every red blooded man will do, I jump right in the middle. There you go. Yes, sir. No, I didn't do that, really. I kind of wish I would have now because she was a good-looking gal, by the way. She was cute. Anyway, I divorced her, and that was uh, 21 years ago. Anyway, the way I stay sober this afternoon is that uh, I don't drink anymore, I don't drug anymore, and I don't get married no more. And I don't die. Thank you so much. Enjoyed this recording. To obtain additional copies, receive a free catalog of AA and Al Anon talks, or to find out about our tape and CD of the Month Club, call Encore Audio Archives at 1 800 878 1308 or visit our website at www.12steptapes.com.
been afraid of changes But you show me life is full of faces Sometimes clouds got in our favorite places But we were young and unaware Every night 